because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Coach, I wanted to let you know the dates for the two-day BI Academy weekends have been announced. The North American event will take place in Dallas, Texas, June 6th to 7th weekend. The Europe event will take place in Antwerp, Belgium, June 13th to 14th. Please go to basketballmersion.com slash clinics to get all the details as I want to bring as many as coaches as possible together for this interactive coaching development weekend. This year, the event is open to Basketball Immersion members and non-members. The BI Academy mission is simple. Share the game, help you become a better coach. Join this amazing community experience in Dallas or Antwerp. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash clinics. Coach is excited today to welcome Gannon Baker with us. Gannon is the GOAT, skill development coach in the world. and Someone who influenced me a lot, especially as a young coach, when I got a chance to watch many of his videos and learn from him. And uh, his tireless work ethic and passion for the game shines through in everything he does. And, uh, 25 plus years right now he's been involved in basketball, but uh, 20 as an independent global professional skill development coach, consultant, and speaker. Again, and welcome to the podcast. Chris, it's an honor to be on. You know, you influenced me since we met, and I enjoy learning from you, and hopefully we can add some value to all the listeners today. Let's go. Well, I know you will. I know you will. And uh, let's start with, uh, I mean, 20 plus years in this profession, doing what you do is, is remarkable. And just the sustained success is always something that impresses me from people. So what have been some of the keys to your long-term success as a skill development profession? I mean, that's a great question. I think the key to sustainability is to always know why you got in in the first place. You, you have to have a root in your mind and in your soul of passion. Nobody should ever jump into something because they can, you know, for what they get out of it. Right. As far as byproducts, you know, money, popularity, shiny objects, so to speak, those have some kind of value. But you really want to do things that bring you tremendous joy. And, you know, one way to do that is to help other people. And I just fell in love with the game of basketball when I was eight. And I knew who I was and I knew what I wanted to do. And that was, you know, help young players, uh, old players, just players get better at basketball in the game of life. So you know, through 25 years, I mean, even through the first year, every year is going to bring battles. Every year in any industry, any team is going to go through seasons of, of adversity, seasons of trouble, you know, a battle, if you will, because everybody's trying to get that victory and, they, and they, they're excited about that. But if, if anybody has any sense about them or if anybody's ever been in a fight, you understand that the only way to a victory is, is to go through a battle. So, you know, through 25 years of running my own business and, and, dealing with pros and the cons of the game and of, of the business, you know, I never quit. I never had a plan B. I never divorced it. I never lost my love for it. So it's a, it's an agape, an unconditional love for basketball that no matter what, I'm going to find a way to get up every morning and, and coach this game and try to impact lives through the game. And so that's what I've done. So that, you know, that's one way that I've, I've been able to sustain. I'm still doing that is, is to have that love and passion, even through the bad times. And then it's, it's the ability to grow. It's the ability to not get stale and stuck because if you do it, I don't care how much you love your team or you, your coach. And there's going to be times where you just feel stuck and you don't feel like doing it. And it's called the law of familiarity. It just doesn't have that zeal, that zest anymore. And you got to find different creative ways to reinvent yourself, to say the same thing in a different way to maybe hear a different voice and to grow. So over the, over the 25 years, man, I've just been adding, I guess, tools to my toolbox. I got that from Kobe. Tools to my coaching toolbox when I played, you know, different things to add to my game. It's the same with coaching. You know, you just grow every year. You adjust to uh, the trends of the game and, and, and the uh, different personalities of kids and the generations and stuff. And so between those two, that's how I've, I've sustained it. Because with growth, you know, if, if you have growth, you, you, you become happy. You know, that, that's where you get satisfaction and fulfillment is, is through growth, in my opinion. Well, two things stand out, Coach. Number one is how impressive, and I saw you at Coaching You last year, shout out to uh, Brennan Surfer for hosting both of us and tremendous experience connecting with you there. But 
how good you still are with all your demonstrations, obviously your fitness, the different things. I mean, a huge part of probably your success, I imagine, is your role modeling. You live it. You don't just say that you're passionate. You don't just say that you get up every day and you find motivation. You live it and you show it in how you demonstrate and how you coach. Has that always been a foundation of what you do? Yeah, you know, I, I guess that was a gift of mine. I think all of us are given gifts by uh, by God, or if you don't believe in God, you know, higher power or the universe, right? Everybody has a gift, but it's up to us to develop it. It's up to us to up to hone it. It's up to us to unwrap it, figure out how to use it, play with it, enjoy it, make it better. And so, you know, my parents have always been into uh, physical fitness. My, my dad was a coach. My mom was a tremendous runner and workout nut. And so that was just our lifestyle. So as a player, I was short, you know, six foot. I wanted to play at the highest level. So I knew I had to be in shape. And so I just had a foundation as a player of being in shape when I got into coaching. If you want to be great at something, you go, you go to somebody that's great, that's already done it, and you try to simulate what they do, but add, add your own authentic style. So one of the first guys I've ever seen be a player development coach or teach kids how to do skills was a guy named Austin Lehman. And I don't even know if you know who he is, but he was a ball handling guru. His, his brother was George. They're from New Jersey. I saw them at Paul Webb's basketball camp when I was 11 years old. and It changed my life. And the next year, John Miller, a coach at uh, Blackhawk High School, legendary coach in, in Pennsylvania, his son was demonstrating on how to work out and how to get after it. Well, his son was Sean Miller, the head coach at Arizona. He ended up playing at Pittsburgh. I ended up playing against Sean my freshman year when I was at Duquesne because we always played Pitt in the Civic Arena. It was, it was a joy. But I was like, okay, well, you know, this is how you're, you're supposed to teach kids. You're supposed to – and then at Five Star, I saw Rick Pitino, right, when he was in Kentucky. And I saw QB Brown and Mike Pitello. And those guys, you know, had passion and had zeal and, and had intensity. And they banged guys. They guarded guys. Rick Pitino actually played guys one-on-one -on -one and actually did the drill. And so, okay, that's how the great ones are supposed to – to do and one of the greatest teachers I think who ever lived is Jesus Christ. He not only demonstrated, right, but he explained. And, and the good teachers explain, the great teachers demonstrate. And so if you want your players to demonstrate any value, then then you know, you know, if you can, the highest level of teaching is to model it. So, you know, ever since I got in the coach and I never lost, I never got out of shape. And obviously I can't 360 dunk and show kids you know, how to be super, super quick, but you know, you do the best you can physically. You, you engage them with some sweat. If you want them to sweat, sometimes you got to sweat with them. If you want, I always believe bones over cones. You know, I got that from Cody top. I like to use flesh to keep it fresh. I don't use a lot of resources in my workouts. I use some, but you know, if you can guard guys, if you can put hands on guys, if you can simulate the contact on offense and defense in a player development workout with the guys. I mean, that's the highest level of relearning and it translates. So yes, Chris, I spend a lot of time each week. I'm going to do it after this podcast just to go work out, stretch, take care of my body. I'm 47 at, at the present moment. Doesn't get any easier. Time is undefeated, but I'm going to call it bluff. Wake up every day. Let's fight and let's get after it. Love it. Love it. And I want to come back to talking about resources, workouts, things like that, but Let's start with giving some coaches some actionable stuff in terms of let's start with have changed in the way that you teach now players, because I imagine your workouts have changed a lot over the 20 plus years in terms of how you interact and teach the player. It's a great question. You know, early on, even when I was coaching in college, because that was my first, well, actually I got my first coaching job at five stars and 18 year old. And then at the age of 23, I was a GA at Hampton and then, you know, I did about four more years of college coaching, and then I was always in charge of player development, scouting. And one one thing I did back then that I don't do as much now is, man, I give a lot of. I, back then, I gave the players a lot of information. I gave, I said, hey, here's what to do, and I would go on to talk for like three, four, five minutes, and it was information overload. And they, you know, they, they had their attention because I was, you know, charismatic. I was always intense, and you know, I was hands on. So I got their, their attention, but I'm not sure they retained. Because, you know, I over overcoached, I overtalked, I, I gave him too much information. I didn't coach in soundbite. I didn't, uh, you know, limit my information. I didn't get in and get out. It was a lecture. And the biggest thing that I do now that I didn't do back then is, is ask questions. You know, I ask them questions. Well, what do you think about how should we guard this ball screen? They did this the first, right? How do you think the defense is going to play you if you make this move? 
if you drive here, where are your three, uh, you know, three receivers? So it's like, I didn't do a lot of that. And I think if you want the kids to have the right answers, you got to ask them the right questions. And if they can right, give you the answer, if, if you can teach them how to think, not, not just what to think, I think they're going to, their aptitude, which is ability to learn will increase. And then you'll have quicker learning and then quicker game application from your workouts. And so now, you know, I might let the kids figure, well, I do let the kids figure it out a little bit more, even beginners. You know, I don't uh, cookie cut and, and, and hand deliver them everything unless they're really, really struggling. And then that's when I jump in. So great question, Chris. I think we all need to uh, self-evaluate where we are and how we can be more efficient as teachers. Well, you, you couldn't stay in the profession as long as you did do that. And then the other part that goes with that in terms of connecting with players and you talked about short bursts, but this has got to be such a key part of what you do because it's a workout, it's not a lecture. So what are some ways that you have found best to be able to quickly connect with players to build trust, which I imagine, again, is such a huge part of what you do? Yeah, great question, because it's not what they know, it's whether they trust you and do you have that buy-in. And so some some ways that I've been able to get a buy-in from players is, you know, I, I beat them to the gym, you know, Kobe mentality, get there first, set the gym up, have it organized. They come in, it's all about how they're feeling. And I don't even talk about basketball, you know, it's, hey, how's you sleep last night? What'd you do? If it's the first time, hey, do you have a family? Uh, oh, okay. And it's just, it's all about them making them feel like they're important. It's not just about basketball. So really getting to know them as a person. And that all happens even before the stretching and stuff. And then during the workout, it's like, again, it's not about the coach, but I always have a mentality because I was the white guy walking into the all black gym at the boys club and saying, you know, who has next? And they'd look at you based on how you looked. And, and it was a disrespect already just because you're short and white. And they, anyway, so it was always like, I right, well, wait till I play because you can't check me. And that's how I am as a coach. I walk into a, a workout and that player is not going to match my passion. If he does, I've done my job. But that's the competitor. You're not going to outwork me, LeBron James. You're not going to outwork me, a little eighth grade female. Whoever I'm working out, if it's a, if it's a camp, I'm going to be the most passionate, hardest working coach in that gym because I want to set the tone. And now they got to raise my level. And then they have to exceed even my expectations. So it's, so it's that. So I'm, I've always worked as hard or harder than my players. And, again, I'm not doing the drill with them, but I'm coaching hard, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sweating. I think – Coaches out there, you know, understand how a coach should work hard. And then it's competency, right? A great way, especially for an elite player, to get their trust and, con and connect to them is teach them what they don't know. Get them to a level where their mind and body has never been. And that's just, from your perspective as a coach, that's just studying. It's studying his game. It's studying his system. It's studying the game. It's going to clinics. It's, I mean, Chris, your Twitter, I mean, you drop bombs every day. So it's like getting on stuff, learning it, and then finding out, you know, what that player needs and plugging a term or a concept or a story or, or a value, just giving them one thing for that summer, that week, that day that they can chew on and, and get better at that. There's the respect. Cause if you show an elite player what they don't know, man, they're engaged because they, they don't want that. They don't want to feel like they're, they're the most ignorant person in the room. And now you're giving them value. You're making deposits mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually into them. And so, you know, those two strategies I use the most. That's great. Great information, great knowledge. And as you were saying that, what struck me is a little bit, too, is this question of the balance between learning and working out with repetition. Because often what I see from a lot of skills trainers is just literally just their workouts with repetition. And there's not a lot of new development or new learning or additions or refinements. What is the art in terms of that for you in terms of balance too? Because if you have too much of one or too much of the other, obviously the, the athlete could be focused, they could be, you know, they could be struggling too much. And uh, part of your job is to build comfort and confidence. Yeah, you know, one of the uh, one of my mentors, Pete Strickland, uh, used to work for Olive Purnell, uh, played at DeMatha under Morgan Wooten, DeMatha guy. He always taught me to coach on the fly which means, you know, as, as they're doing workouts, as they're in the practice, you know, make your voice very 
uh, at a high tone, speak from your gut, make sure they hear you. But, you know, coach on the fly, I mean, as they're doing it, you're given constructive criticism, you're getting feedback. When you give feedback, make sure it's like a sandwich method, a positive and negative. Maybe it's a big, big Mac sandwich, negative, negative, but always end on a positive. And when you give feedback during the workout, during the active play and not stopping, make sure it's precise, make sure it's specific. No, get to the 45, left foot, left hand, eyes up, not just, come on, let's go. There you go. It's, you know, th- th- there's got to be weight behind your words, right? And your words have to speak life and, and direction and clarity. So to me, it's constantly finding creative ways where the, the player can remember. So it's increasing your vocabulary. It, it's increasing your you know, arsenal of, 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 of the English language. And then it's, it's just during that workout, you're just in the, in the present. You're self-aware. You, you got to know what you're looking for. So if it's a ball screen, you know, first thing you look for is that ball on the side pick and roll. That ball handler can't be near the sideline. So you're looking at that. Then you're looking at, all right, he's got to wait for the screen. Okay, you got that done. Then you're looking at the screener. You know, is he coming up disengaged from his defender? What's the angle he's setting? So you got to know at least three teaching points for every skill, whether it be team or individual, that, that you want to have. And then you, that, that's what you're interjecting. And, and, and so you interject with praise, repeat directions, stop it for five to ten seconds. You know, I call that a, a pause, VCR pause, remote control. But, you know, if they're not getting it, then then you got to time out because all they're doing is reinforcing bad habits. But, again, every coach needs reps, man. And that's what that's what irritates me about some of these uh, skill trainers that get into my industry because anybody can do it. It's not like, you know, a, a real coaching job where you got to apply, you got to, you know, be accountable to an AD or a GM. I mean, if, if you look the part and, and you're good on the internet and you're somewhat organized, you can go out and be a street baller that's never played the game and do what I do in my industry. So a lot of these guys get into the industry without any coaching reps, without any coaching philosophies, right? They have no clue how to teach or, or converse or even connect and, and, and respond to, to people. So with that, with that being said, one of the ways that I've gotten better is, man, I just had a lot of practice at, you know, giving feedback, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, seeing, okay, I talk too much. They lost their sweat and tension. You know, this, this, you know, it's just a lot of coaching reps uh, in that lab, man. And the more you do something, obviously the mother of success is repetition, the better you get. So the rise of a celebrity trainer, right? Like that they're social media influencers. They're, you know, obviously being talked about in this hierarchy of success of a player. And part of that is good. It's good for your profession. It's good for my profession in the sense that coaches are being valued. But is there part of that that is dangerous as well, that it's gone too far? What is your thought on the rise of this celebrity trainer? Because you were the original one in a time when, you know, social media and all these different things didn't probably glorify you to the extent that it would nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it's good if you're te- – I mean, the bottom line is I don't care what kind of coach you are. In, in my opinion, and a lot of people agree with this, your two main jobs of a coach, teach them how to win at basketball, teach them how to win at life. That's it. That's it. Awesome. And so, yeah, and so if, if you're doing that as a celebrity trainer, God bless you. I don't study the industry. I just know I'll get a feed every now and then and see a guy labeling himself a, a player development coach and – I mean, hell, he might have a million followers and all his posts are him training NBA guys and just taking pictures. And then he's training reality stars and he's the NBA all star. I mean, he's advertising products. Well, maybe you're not a coach. Maybe maybe there's a different title. I just I just want our industry to clear up because people that know me obviously respect my reputation. But people that don't know me. Right. will say. Oh, you're one of them skill trainer guys. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm a coach, but yeah, yeah, I am. I'm a skill trainer. I guess it's, it's, you know, our industry is so mucked up that there's no clear, like what is it? Like who, what is a skill trainer? And so that's what I'm trying to do. I've always tried to do that. Right. Always tried to do that. I have the DVDs, the VCR tapes actually to back it up. My philosophy hasn't changed. I am a coach. I don't care whether you're a team coach for the Spurs or, a grade school coach in Calgary, like your job is to teach these kids in practice, right? How to have fun, how to work hard, how to have grit and how to work together. 
And thus you're trying to win. And so in life, when you have a relationship with your family, you're trying to run a business, you face some adversity in life, you're trying to win that day. You're trying to get over that battle. You're trying to get over that debt or the divorce or whatever it is. You're trying to find something you love. You're trying to find a cure for the virus. I mean, that's all you're trying to do. So basketball is just a platform. So I wish more people that had more followers than me on, on the social media would, would just have some professional sense about them to teach real basketball in real life. But it's become, you know, it's become a reality show for, for a lot of these guys. And that's the part that I, and I just don't agree with and don't like. But again, if it, I think it helps me because at least if you look at what we do, Chris, hey, we're, I think we're real coaches. We're not perfect coaches. We're not geniuses, but we're real coaches. We know the game and we both are living a, a successful life. Well said. Well said. And, and it's, it's, it struck me a lot because I've seen a lot of really good skills trainers and I've seen some on that other side of the spectrum. And I, I think, again, it's, it's not to categorize, but there's a big difference between coaching and doing workouts. And what I see a lot of the skills trainers, just players are literally just there doing workouts, just reps after reps after reps, no feedback. And then they leave there and they got a great workout, physical thing. They got to re refine their skills or so to speak, because they just doing reps, mostly block reps. And then after all that, there's certainly value to that. And some players yeah. probably crave that at that point, because it's all about comfort and confidence, right? It's about just staying, hey, in that belief mindset. But if you're talking about true development, then there needs to be teaching and there needs to be learning. And that's what I believe you're talking about most, is that there's got to be coaching within to work out. Yeah, you know, there's got to be feedback, there's got to be coaching, and there's got to be uh, the ability to take what you did with that kid in that workout and, and then teach them how to relate it to the game. And that's where the disconnect is between a lot of high school coaches, middle school coaches, AAU coaches, college coaches, and these so-called celebrities, and even the pros. Like back when I was training pros, man, they hated guys like me coming into the arena to train their guy because they feel like, well, we're the NBA, we know more than you, and we, we hire guys to do what you're doing. But I get it. Like, guys want to hear a different voice and they're tired of being around. So, but now it's it's accepted. Like, you see tons of NBA coaches following these NBA skill coaches on, on uh, Instagram. And they're welcome because if you disrespect or badmouth or treat this independent skill trainer bad, then that player is going to feel offense. And now you might get fired. So the power is definitely in the player. And, and these NBA guys know that. So they're not held account. These the NBA skill trainers know that. So a lot of them are not – you know, held it accountable. They just want to manage and, and be friends with these NBA guys. And so that's the relationship is, Hey, I, yeah, I'll, I'll rebound for you. Like my girlfriend would do for me. Hey, can you come work me out? Pop, can you come work me out? And basically it would just rebound for you and give you hey, good job, boy. I, you probably want, but there's no confrontation because the only way with a resolution to, to correct is, is you got to confront you praise, right. And you correct wrong, but there's no bull crap and there's no superficial basketball relationship there. There's a real friendship there. And that's fine. And, 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 you know, a lot of these trainers know that if or don't, maybe don't even have the skill to confront or the confidence, because if they did, then they would lose that client. If they lose that client, they lose their followers and if they lose their followers. Man, what, what have they got left? And I've always said, I don't care about technology. I just want to teach. You know, if I have passion and I can teach and I can impact your life and game, man, that, that's my marketing strategy. You know, uh, the, the game, God, life will take care of me if I give everything I have as a developer, as a teacher, not as a glorified friend, agent, manager, tech guy that, that films workouts. And, and now I, I can leverage this workout with whoever to gain more advertisements and popularity. So that's, that's my problem, Chris, to get back to your question is, man, how can they get these players to another level? How can they add a tool to their toolbox? It's not by a cone. It's not by med balls. It's not by jumping on boxes or mats. Like take all the resources out, man. Like you got to impart knowledge into his brain and you got to impart an intensity into his heart. And then you got to have a good balance of teaching and getting a workout. And that's an art, man. I'm still learning how to do that to the best of my ability. Well, it's such great points there. And, and just, again, people keep in mind, like I hate generalizations. I don't like generalizing. We're not sure. talking about all skills trainers. There's some really good ones at all levels yep. that I've seen. But yep. the one thing is that's a challenge for a skills trainer, and maybe you can comment on this, is 
your job, to a certain extent, you getting rehired, you staying with a client, you keep going back to certain camps or working with players, is based on their enjoyment of working with you. So by nature, coaching is, again, from a player's perspective, sometimes coaching, or mostly by players nowadays, is interpreted as negative. So when you coach them, you're actually potentially harming your job security. And I imagine that's why a lot of these trainers are really smart and they don't do any coaching because that can impact their job. All they want to do is tell them, oh, you're getting so much better and you're doing better and look at this because that helps job security. Yeah, 100%. And that's the double-edged sword there. But I, I just know uh, being in the industry, you know, if you, if you don't, if you can't be yourself and you can't speak the truth, live the truth, confront the truth, and you're not dealing in the truth every day, you're not going to be at peace as a coach. You know, a lot of these NBA coaches, I know for a fact, they might not admit this or say this on the record, right? But I guarantee, I mean, I, I, I know, I know a lot of them are not at peace because they can't, right? They can't cross that line because if they do, right? And they, and they talk about the elephant in the room and they clear the air, right? So to speak on certain issues that kids, that these NBA players, WNBA players have, then they're going to get fired because, oh, you're disrespecting me. Or, man, I don't like you no more. Let's get out of here. You, who are you? Well, I'm just a coach uh, acknowledging the truth. Right? And the truth fears no question. Now, I, certain guys have been able to do that. Phil Jackson, you know, Cheryl Reeves, WNBA. I mean, Doc Rivers, QB Brown. There, there's been a lot of Steve Kerr, Pop. There's been a lot of guys that can speak the truth and get away with it and, and, and have developed that. But many young coaches nowadays, a lot of my friends, Gosh, man, they just can't say what's on their mind. They got to figure out a way, right, to Jedi mind trick them. And they got to manipulate the truth, manipulate their emotions in the sense of, I, I need to tell this player something, but I can't because he gets sensitive when I give him feedback, especially in front of camera, especially in front of his teammates, especially because he just doesn't, doesn't like to be wrong. And so that's the thing with me is, is that I've never done that. Uh, good, bad, and different. Would it get me more followers? Sure. Would it have made me a lot more money? Maybe. But I tell you what, I'm at peace because I coach with purpose, passion, and the truth. Now, I've scaled down some of my confrontation techniques and, and, uh, and things like that. But it's like I'm old school that way, but new school, I'm meeting kids where they're at. And I think that's the key now is just be a little more patient, be a little more tolerant, and just meet kids where they're at. Because, I mean, look at the John Beeline situation. I mean, I've known him for years. My brother played for him. I was able to, to be in that program for, for uh, two years when Jonathan, my brother, played for him. John Beeline is a sweetheart, legend, Hall of Famer. And it wasn't a Cavs problem, right? I mean, it wasn't a Coach Beeline problem. It was a Cavs problem, man. Like, he was confronting guys. He was making guys work on their game. Whether he called them thugs or not, that's irrelevant because they, they, they are called worse by haters in their social media and by their teammates. It comes down to that kind of stuff right there. It's like Coach Beeline just told the truth and they got him fired. And probably, Coach, in my opinion, he didn't get to Kevin Love enough. I think if he had had the best player on the team's back and thumbprint, they would have been fine. But I don't think anybody on the team supported him just because, you know, from a distance, knowing Coach Beeline reading wrote what I read, I mean, he just, he just coached him up. He coached them up. He, he was coaching one of the worst teams in the league, and they acted like they were the best. So it's like, you know, the players got a problem, in my opinion. Well, it, that and that's a, yeah, and that's a whole separate conversation. But it speaks to the point that you're making, which is like it's almost like we've got to walk this tightrope as coaches. And yeah. it, it's, it's a very difficult tightrope to walk. And let's go back a little bit to younger players, and let's go back to high school players in that sense. And talking about this tightrope, because again, you, you do have to balance how you approach correction and correction is immediately interpreted by a player as something negative, Correct. but it's really something positive and we have to shape it and present it that way. Can you speak a little bit about how you present it that way as correction yeah, being positive? Absolutely. You know, number one is the lead up, get to the gym early. I'm working harder than a kid. I know just as much or more than a kid about basketball. I have information that he doesn't have because the only way to uh, success is, is information. You, you can only rise above the information you have. You can't get to a place if you don't have the information about that place. And then you got to understand it. And so as a coach, boy, you, your curriculum better be legit. You better be able to go out there and coach without notes. It better be organic. And if it's not, you better study. 
And so that all of that leads up to the player knowing that you know your stuff. And so as a coach, every time I confront, I got confidence. Because I'm always waiting. Because it's the nature. It's the nature of kids, man. To be 13 to 28 means to be ignorant and inconsistent. They're, they're at the height of their ignorance and inconsistency. So were we. I mean, I'm still ignorant and inconsistent. It's, it's the nature of, of human beings. So I'm waiting for that confrontation of, hey, F you, coach. And again, easier for me now than back then. But I don't get offended. I don't take it personal. Okay, F me. But okay, once you calm down, JoJo, educate me. If you're going to F me, then you better educate me. Why? Are you right? And it's that kind of, you know, it's a question. It, it's, it's You're Tom Cruise and a few good men. You know what I mean? You're confronting the general and you're not standing down and your body language is legit. See, when you command a message, when, you, when you're a leader, you have three commands. You have command over your presence, right? Yeah, your presence better be legit. Number two, you have command over your message. Like, is your message the truth? Are you saying? With, and then the third is command of your tone. And so your tone is pretty much what the players disagree with because they think you're yelling and you're just teaching. They think you're hating and you're just loving. So anytime that I instruct, I say it with a smile. I go up to them, yo, what you do? You know, it's a smile. It's sarcasm. I don't break their spirit, but I'm trying to break their habit. I use humor a lot. I touch them, high five, high five. Yo, why'd you do that, dog? You know, I use slang. You know what I mean? I use uh, terms they would hear in, in music. Come on, Bubsy. You know, come on, pumpkin. Like it's, it's I get them to, uh, I, 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 I get their attention, right? I get them to smile and I get them to agree. And if there's a disagreement, we don't, all right, let's, let's take it out during a uh, water break, but we'll come back to that. But you got to be, as a coach, you got to be able to move on and not take it personal because they're not going to get everything. And so it's not a, it's not a fight, right? You confront them with uh, the, 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 the truth and, and the way you do it. So for me, it's a lot of smiles. It's a lot of, uh, engagement, you know, on hand stuff. And then if, if there's a total disrespect against my non-negotiables, like your core values, if that's the situation, man, then you got to run them, kick them out, find them. You know, if it's a non-negotiable confrontation and they're, and they're not, uh, well, they're not buying it. They, uh, they don't, they, they don't repent, you know, and they don't ask for forgiveness and they don't agree on that mistake. All right, that, then you got to run them. Then you got to stop practice because now you're crossing the line with your non-negotiable, with your core values. Uh, I, I had, I'm just sharing this because I think the audience would be curious to hear this. But you know, one one thing I heard from one skills trainer was this: is that he doesn't take any money from a player. This is we're just talking about the pro level. He doesn't take any money from a player in the first whatever, say six, seven, eight sessions they do. Because he first wants to make sure that it's going to be able to work, right? Like, and it makes sense to me is that he wants, first of all, that there be, this is not a transaction. The first thing we're trying to do is to transform. And if you're not going to buy in to how I'm going to help you transform, and that's an agreement between the two, clearly, about what needs to be developed, then it's not going to work out. Like, it can't be a transaction without the transformation for a player to be able to truly improve. And it just struck me as you're saying that, how important that is and how well you phrase that for people to understand. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that philosophy. I personally don't use that. <laughs> I mean, I've yeah. never used that. No, no, no. But again, it's but, uh, it again. But, but yeah, but yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think it's a slippery slope when you're a skills coach, you know, running a business, you have a, a responsibility to your family and to your life. And you, you do things based on, well, a coach would do this because it's about the game. Yeah, I get it. You're right. But, you know, bottom line is you're, you're you know, you, Chris, if you and I didn't make money, we, we wouldn't be probably, you know, we probably wouldn't have met each other. And, and we would we wouldn't be doing this right now because I'd be out somewhere trying to earn some money using my degree. But, you know, I, mean, well, I want to speak to it. that. Let, let's speak to that, yeah. coach, because I know you get it. I get it. And almost any coach that's tried to do something to make money has got this from people. Well, you shouldn't be charging kids. And it's Correct. like, well, you would never say that to an accountant. You never say that to a lawyer. You never yeah. say that to other people. You know what Correct. you provide, coach? You provide tremendous value. You deserve to be rewarded, not just holistically, but financially for the time you put in. Because all the time you put in is time away from you doing other things. This is truly a profession. And you've been someone that's made this a profession. And we all thank you for that. 
Yeah, thank you, Chris. I had to sell my tail off back in 2000 when there was no internet, no social media, and I had to convince the market that no, you know, I can I can help your high school coach. I can, or if as a high school coach, I can I can help your program as a parent. You know, I, I know this is not you know normal, but just trust me on that. Like, so I still have that hungriness and, and humbleness that every day I go out. I understand that time and money are the two biggest resources people have. And this is not normal. It's not normal to pay an independent coach money to train kids on the side or to do a camp because it's been done for years just as volunteers. However, now our industry has an entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, I'm working on now to help colleges have a sports entrepreneur degree where you take your business courses and then you take your your skill sports set. And now you're leaving college as a young 20 year old to go out and run a sports program for a living. And I know for a fact, there's many of us in this industry making well over six figures and you, you got doctors making as much or not even that much. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a lucrative industry, which gets to my point. That's why I'm professional. That's why I go above and beyond. That's why I'll go extra. I mean, I always go over. It might be a four-hour camp. I'll go four and a half. It might be an hour of talk. If I'm allowed, I'll go an hour. I got always, after the workout, I'm texting the guy. I'm sending him free material. So I'm not stingy by any means, but I understand. that People in our industry have to understand that the more we give out for free, right, in my opinion, the less people value. And the more you give somebody for free, the less they appreciate it. So I would give an NBA guy one or two workouts. All right, man. You've been with me for four hours. You see what I do from here on out. You got to value my time because I like to train you, but I don't need to. I got into this just to train players that are passionate and have a mutual respect. And so that's why I, you know, I still have that attitude. And and that's why I I probably train more outside NBA players than not, because I feel like I I can make more of an impact and I feel I'm more appreciated doing things outside the NBA and W. Now, don't get me wrong. The best job in the world, is to go train a WNBA, NBA player, because if, if they're elite, boy, they make you better. They teach you. It's the, it's the best, you know, time flies because it's, it's, not, it's not true work. But a lot of professional players, a lot of elite players take things for granted or self-absorbed or entitled. And that's just, man, that's just hard to take in. That's just, ooh, that's the time stealer right there for me. So I always tell people that are doing this, man, don't, un- like you said, don't undervalue what you do. You're a business. You're an entrepreneur. You provide a service. And the last time I checked, you know, the banks weren't giving out free money. So they, people got to make a deposit in your life, right, for you to make an even bigger deposit in theirs. And that kind of, that's financially, socially, the whole holistic model, man. You can't disrespect. Because if you don't value money, you'll never reach your financial goals. And so... Um, I'm not trying to make a lot of money to have eight cars. I'm just trying to help people's lives. For example, uh, we, we adopted a child, five-year-old girl, five years ago. And that was expensive. And I couldn't do that if I didn't grind in basketball. You know what I mean? We helped multiple families move from the Bahamas to Fort Lauderdale this past summer based on the hurricane trauma. My wife and I couldn't do that if, if we didn't grind and, and do all these camps and workouts and et cetera. You know what I mean, I'm providing four or five people a job right now in my business and they love their job. But I couldn't do that if we didn't make money. So that's my whole thing, man, is if, if a lot of these guys are making money at basketball, that's great. Turn around and help somebody do the same. Turn around and use that money for something good, even if it's bad basketball money. Right. Turn around and use something for good. So I've always told this. I'll take a drug dealer's money in a second. Right. I'll take a John that runs the prostitution ring. I'll take his donation of a million dollars for a second and go build a home for underprivileged kids or go build a, a sex uh, abuse clinic. Right. Because because money doesn't have a personality. Money doesn't have a spirit. It's the people that use it. That That's well, where it becomes important. Well, so that's why service. Chris, yeah. You know, my, money, Coach, our service is valuable. Yeah. Your service to the game goes beyond the transaction. And that's that's tremendous. And and we, we know anyone that's been around you so tremendous to be able to kind of have you as a role model in that way. So just just shifting a little bit, we, we talked a little bit about the shiny object. And and I want to phrase something in this way to say the shiny objects or 
the fancy moves to attract players to your brand aren't inherently bad, right? Like they aren't inherently bad in the sense that to a certain extent, all players at all levels are attracted first to maybe some extrinsic motivation. Oh, that looks really cool. I like to learn that. But then beyond that, it's the substance and what actually helps them perform better. So when you're talking about shiny objects or doing some moves, because again, one of the things that attracted me to you first was, wow, this guy can really dribble the ball and look at those moves. That's kind of an extrinsic motivation. Is that fair to say that that's part of the branding of kind of what you do and how you do, but then really it's a substance that sustains it. And that's why you've been in the profession for so long. Yeah. Great question, Chris. You must run a podcast daily or something. A hundred percent. I mean, one of the things that, that I was good at because I was a point guard and you know, I wasn't very rich as a, as a child. I mean, my parents were teachers and, we didn't do a lot like these kids do now to have a little bit of money. So I just had a ball all day and I dribbled it. And so that was one of the, the, the eye catching, the attention getters, the things that people see and it impacts you internally, emotionally. And now you want to make an emotional connection to that guy because he can do something really neat that other people can't do. And he does it at a high level. It's Cirque du Soleil, right? It catches your attention. You'll pay for that. So obviously I, I leveraged that first DVD or workout I ever did was with N one during the time of the N one, you know, tour and street ball was infiltrating our game and uh, some good in a way, some bad. And so uh, championship production, Tom McDonald came to me and said, Hey, can you do a fundamental tape on street moves? I was like, perfect. I'll put fundamental in the street. And so that's what I did. And it was 35 moves. And all the moves were one second, two second. All the moves were, you know, maybe three or four dribbles, but we were all going downhill. It was all fundamental. And so that, so I I took the sexy and I taught that, but I, I, but I taught it with substance. And that's where these young cats, man, they don't get it. You can be sexy, but you got to keep it relevant to the game. If you want to teach us James Harden step back or Euro step, then do it off a really good kick and roll angle or do it off a wide pin and have a defender guarding you. So now you're you're talking about spacing and you're talking about using a screen and ball movement and you know you know you're hitting them with a hey, you know 1.9 rule on the catch get 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 what you need to done in 1.9 or give it up and so that's I still do that man I, I teach the sexy but I give it substance and if you do that you'll get the respect of the outside siders and then you get respect of the uh, professionals and and you can kind of. You know, everybody might not like you, but everybody will respect you and say, yep, he's teaching the right things. I'll give you a quick example to support what you just said is I had the fortune of training a pretty good college player who's worked with what you would call some celebrity trainers before. And the first workout I did with her, she went to the top of the key. And I was like, wait a minute, we're going to do all these moves from the wing in the corner. And she said yeah. she had never done the moves from the wing in the corner. And I said, I've watched film of you. I've never seen you play off the top. She wasn't a point guard. She was a wing. And it was just something simple like that, that added tremendous substance. It could be teaching the exact same thing, but connecting it better for them so that they can transfer it to the game. So my question to you goes to what do you do? It, say you're working with a college or, or, or pro player. What do you do to evaluate the player prior to working with them? Great question. One word, uh, intel. Intel. So intel could be calling the uh, the coach of that player and asking them transparent questions. What do they like? What do they don't like? What's your role for them? What are your goals for them? Short term, long term? What's their biggest struggle? Just anything, right? What do you, what do you want? Me, what do you want me to do with them during the summer? Hey, she's coming to me once a week. She's going to do it, so there's not a matter of will you let her. You know how kids are, Coach. She's paying me, and so this is a service. I I would love just to do what you want me to do, Coach. Right? What do you want me to do with it? And then, the man, that's it. That's the coach will feel so refreshed that, you know what, I have the power. So this coach is not going to, you know, erase everything that I've been trying to do with this girl for three years, you know. So it's Q&A with the coach. It's watching film of them. And then it's, it's, it's a conversation, a dinner, Skype, however you want to do it live before you work them out. 
And then when you work them out, you a lot a lot of times it's fun for me. I'll put them through my swag workout, where every drill is timed, every drill has a score, and it's it's similar to a a, a pre draft workout. You know, like like the famous Celtic drill that they run. You got to make uh, 15 shots in less than a minute. Catch, shoot, catch right, catch left, pull up, but so, stuff like that. And and just sit there and say, all right, let's see how good you are. And it's an easy workout for you. You don't sweat. You just check boxes in your, you know, spreadsheet and say, you know what? You're supposed to be this first rounder and you failed every drill. You suck right now. And you say it with a laugh and they're like, now you got them. Now you take that spreadsheet and you say, okay, they need to work on floaters. They need to work on, you know, wide pin downs from the left. They need to work on ball screen pull-ups when the defender goes behind shooting for three. They need to work on their runner, whatever, right? And that's easy for me because I've been doing it right I've failed many times on a first workout like gosh that could have been a lot easier I messed that up you know but after doing it so long it's 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 easy it's it's that's fun let's go you know? so the conversation coach you have with the coach let's talk about that because I think that's so important at all levels like if you're going to work one on one with a player I'm saying the part of the conversation with the coach is an important part of that is presenting yourself as someone who's in support of that coach and the player and not a threat to that coach, right? Like you're trying to present this to the player and to the coach to say, hey, listen, I'm here to support their improvement so that they're better in your team situation. Yeah, correct. And, and, and a lot of that has to do with know who you're talking to before you call. Like you, you should automatically know who the coach is, what team he coaches, the record, what kind of offensive system they run. Right. And, and watch film of, of the player that you're working out and see the game spots that the coach puts them in on offense. And, you know, if, if she's a, a pick and roll girl instead of a pick and pop or pick and short roll girl, then you got to know that coming in so that the coach says, man, this guy feels like I'm talking to an assist, you know, one of my assistants. And, and, and if you're good at your craft, you can be that in that conversation. You can call him as a hired you know, consultant. Man, this it sounds like this guy has been working for me for all year. He he knows our stuff. So then it's an instant trust. I, I mean, Chris, I really believe if you work on your game as a coach and you believe in, in God, he all gives us a king inside of us or a queen inside of us. Like, I really believe you and I can change a person's mindset and even eventually life in an hour because a movie has changed my life in an hour. A person has changed my life in an hour and a day. You know, now it's hard to do. Yeah. Does it happen every decade? I don't know. But I, I, I go into every room thinking, man, I'm going to try to change this person's life. So I'm on, like I'm passionate. I, you know, so that's the conversation. He's got to feel your passion. He's got to feel your understanding. He's, he's got to hear your grace. He's got to hear your humility. It's not about you. It's about coach. I'm here to help. And so it's that kind of tone and spirit. And you back that up with your intel. Know what the coach runs. You know the role that coach has for the player you're about to train based on the film you watched and the research you've done. And then you, you got to be able to confront with grace. You got to be able to agree to disagree because there's many ways to winning, right? There's many ways to winning. For example, you know, cause that coach might not, is not going to be wrong about his philosophy and you're, you're not going to be wrong, but you got to meet in the middle and realize what can we do to get this player to be the best version of themselves? Because she's coming to me. So I was training Amari Stoudemire. Terry Porter was the head coach. Steve Kerr was the GM. Right. Dan Marley was one of the assistants. Bill Cartley was one of the assistants. And here I am training them. All right. We're working on pick and pop short rolls. We're working on uh, come. He's coming off a ball screen, backing it up. I so in like all the stuff you see that Warriors doing now, like Amari came to me and said, man, I like your he said, man, I like your guard skills. I love how you did my academy at Nike. I like your guard skills, man. Do you know the NBA game? I'm like, yes. He's like, well, I know, you know, guard skills. So you need to hook me up. Like that was our conversation. And so we were doing unconventional stuff because Amari was a pick and roll guy, lob, right, Nash. So Porter came on the on the floor and said, yo, 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 what are y'all doing? Amari, you ain't popping. Amari, you ain't coming off Buffalo action, which is a four or five, right? Amari, you're going to roll and lob dunk and get rebounds, dog. Keep all that stuff you're doing with, with Bake here in your back pocket. And Amari said, coach, no disrespect. It's, it's in my front pocket now. Watch this. And, and Porter looked at me, and I'm like, hey, man, I'm just getting paid to, to play, man. So he's got my paycheck. You want to take over my paycheck, Coach Porter? I'll do what you want me to do. Because both of y'all are right. 
And then, and so it wasn't like I wasn't embarrassed. I thought it was comical. You know what I mean? I wasn't, you know, now obviously I grew up watching Terry Porter and, and, and Steve Kerr. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? You know, grew up watching him in Arizona and, and, and Bulls. And so I wasn't like, oh my gosh, man, I, I'm ignorant. No, I was like, shoot, what I'm doing is correct. It's just, there's the difference of philosophy. So I was self-aware enough. I was confident enough. I had swag enough to kind of make it. And, and Terry Porter shook his head and walked off and Amari hit me in my chest. Let's go, babe. Get them dudes. Now, did Amari ever become a pick and pop guy? No. Did he ever, you know, that's not the point, but he was working on it. And that's what we were working on. And so that was a kind of a, it, it was a, I'll call that a positive confrontation uh, between us at that moment. And they didn't mess with us ever again. And Steve Kerr, after the first week, got to know me, gave me his number. He said, hey, text me every Friday. Let me know how Amari's doing. We appreciate all you're doing to help our guy. He's like, hey, my love your energy. I love your passion. Good drills. Don't worry about that. We got that. I was like, all right, man, thanks. And so it was, it was kind of uh, it made me realize, you know what, man, just focus on the truth. Focus on other people. And the rest will take care of itself. Because th that's all you can do. Control the uncontrollables. We realize that what you teach, right, there's many ways, to, you know, many pathways to success. A couple of no-nos in basketball for sure. Right. The best thing you can do is to make drills game like all that. But realize, look, your your way is not the only way. It's just a way to be successful. And if it is, you got to own it. And, you know, you, you own it and you live it. Great. Great story. In terms of that. And uh, coach, I want to do a few quick hits with you uh, to try and get through some of these things, which I think are so valuable. But uh, Yeah. What is the most important skill you're teaching at each level? Let's go through three levels here. Let's say yeah. prepubescent. So prior to say 12 to 14, if we're talking about girls and boys, so prepubescent, what's the most important skill in your opinion? I work with kids starting eight, nine and up. So with that is, is just basic fundamentals. And it, and it's even to the point of, and I don't like doing this because I'm, I'm not a PE teacher, <laughs> but motor development, you know, running, skipping, stopping, dropping your hips, back straight, not bend over balancing, you know, all that motor development and skill development that are the most important. And then, you know, obviously they got to play some type of game because you can't just drill. So it's, it's one-on-one -on -one games, right? One-on-one, -on -one, two on two. And then, you know, as a reward, uh, you got to play some five on five, even though you'll see a lot of, a lot of mech mess, you allow them to play five on five and, and let them under, you know, say, this is the preview of what's to come. But that's why we're doing a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, two on two, because you guys don't know how to play with three other teammates yet. So that's why I would do before up to twelve. So after they get so they get to puberty and puberty before college. So let's say roughly high school, maybe late middle school. Yep. What's the so focus then? Now, man, it's it's playing with a teammate. It's 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 understanding obviously skill development, right? A higher level of skill development. So add more skills, increase your range. And, you know, increase your strength, but it's, you know, increase your stamina. But now it's, it's team stuff, man. It's formations, you know, different, how to play out of different formations. Obviously the trend now is five out, no rim runner. Okay. But getting kids to be versatile, every position, learn how to set a screen, learn how to come off a screen, learn how to drive and kick, and then, you know, become really, really good at it for that age. College. Let's stay away from pro, but now they're a college player. Are, are we focused more on what keeps them in their role, what keeps them playing time? Or as you talked about with the Amari example, is there also an opportunity to be, to be able to add something to their game so that they can maybe increase the role and that balance that exists between those? Can you talk about a college level player? Yeah, well, they got to college, assuming we're talking about scholarship athletes, JUCO. Division yeah, let's say they're – you know, most they college got, players were very good high school players, right? They were very correct. skilled high school players. Correct. But in college, they fill a role sometimes. Correct. So it's it's number one, first and foremost, and I think I'm on the same page as you, they have to be a superstar in their role because that's why they got there. A coach recruited, hey, look, you're a point guard, so you run my team. I, I don't want you shooting. I don't, you know, you're not a two guard. Hey, I recruited you as a five. You're a rebounder. You're a screener. I don't want you taking the ball like Draymond off a rebound. That's right. That's, that's when you get to the pro. So it's one being a superstar in your role. Number two, being motivated. Now you're talking about, this is hard, man. My wife's a college coach. 
We talk about it all the time. We see a lack of it. We ourselves are trying not to be that coach, but how do you get these players to emotionally and mentally and even add spiritually be locked in the entire season to the coach's playbook, to the coach's purpose, to the coach's plan? How are you going to fit into the culture? I know everybody does in November, December, but come January, and you got guys playing for themselves or quitting. So they don't bring the best version of themselves every practice. Well, Coach, that, that's unrealistic. No, it's not. Kobe, Sue Bird, Dinah Tri, like Maya Moore, right? Lindsey Whalen, like myself. I wasn't a great player, but, man, every practice I was ready. I laced them up. Pre-practice routine, Ray Allen. Like, how do you get players to be consistently, all right, on board? through the whole year. So th- as a player, like that's what you've got to work on. So it's the podcast you listen to. It's the, it's your diet. It's your sleep. It's your music. You listen. like, what are you putting into you? Who are you listening to? Who's part of your circle, right? Do you need to cut some friends, right? Do you need to cut some hanger honors because they're not feeding you good words because your words become your thoughts and you have 30 seconds to take captive of a thought or it becomes a feeling. And a lot of players lose that team. I'm all, you know, forget about me. I love you. Right. They, 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 they really lose that feeling of family during the year, either because they're not good at their role anymore. Their role has changed. They're on the bench. The team is losing. And now that That's coach, it. that coach, you know, emotionally and mentally, he loses it, too. She loses it, too. Go ahead, Chris, you well, want to say something? I, I, I was just going to say it's a, on that. Yeah, no, I was going to say the main part that I take away there about the college player, especially, is that it becomes about so much more than just basketball. It becomes yep. about all those things around you and that are part of your life as much as it is about basketball. And that's just yep. such a great point I wanted to emphasize. Keep going, yep. Coach. Yeah, so, I mean, you're exactly right. So, you know, after they – the other problem that they have, as I said, is the consistency of, you know, performing that role because of the distractions. And and so that is something that a that a coach has to coach. And, that, and then another – asset of a college player is and this is done pre-practice post-practice offseason adding a tool to the toolbox so Mari Stoudemire pick and, Mari Stoudemire, pick and pop creating off the bounce so to speak like okay I respect you you love the game you want to expand your game I, I'll give you x amount of time before practice after practice during the offseason that you can work on your game so next year you can prove to me that you also can play the two spot you also can get it off the rebound and push it yourself, whatever facet that you're trying to add to your game, whatever skill set, I want to be a starter. I want to play more. Okay. Well then you got to add something to your game. You know, you got another layer, right? Another color to your rainbow. So those three right there. And then adding something is all right. Well, this is what's going to get me a lifetime contract in the NBA or at least the two year, you know, three year deal. I got to add this to my game. So if that's not part of your coach's system, you got to respect that, man. Like, come on. I mean, it's not about you. You don't go to college so you can go pro. You go to college to learn about yourself as a man, learn how to win. And you do that by the platform that Kentucky and basketball and NCAA provides you. So don't get all bent out of shape when I'm not letting you show your NBA skills. That's on you. You, 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 you show me that you can shoot threes like name letter. Then, then, then we'll run some. We'll, we'll have you come off a hot pick and roll at half court. But, but you, it's a show me deal, man. You got to show me, big fella. You can't just tell me. And it can't be your drills on Instagram with your trainer. It's got to be against flesh, you know, in pre practice and pickup games and our summer tours. You know what I mean? So repetition is the mother of success. And that's what these guys got to understand. They get reps, you know, in their role, in their emotions and mind, and adding something to their toolbox. And you got a perfect college career. Coach, one of the things that I took away from watching your stuff as a coach in my development and something that I still value above all else when I'm at clinics with players or, you know, I'm on trips like you do and you go different places working with young people. One of the things that I always try and bring to them is the best ways to train on your own. Because, look, we can take some credit, but most of the credit for the players that develop, it's because they trained on their own. They led yeah. themselves. Can you talk a little bit to some of the things that you have found best practices for players to learn how to train on their own? What are some of the things that they can do with some of the things that you can emphasize to help inspire them or to help guide them in their workouts on their own? 
Yeah, well, I, I would I would say this to that question is players don't anymore. <laughs> like, well, but we have so to get them all, back to that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I hope they listen to us, but that that's you know I don't mean to sound cynical, but but good luck because I I go I've been to forty eight countries, man, and still going, and I never I never Chris I never see guys working on their game by themselves in the gym on their own. Now I went to Memphis for a week, consulted with them and man, Boogie Ellis was in the gym every day and they had two games that week. And, and that was the first in a long time. And I did something, I interviewed him and this, I just was amazed that not because he was a McDonald's all American and a, and a good player, probably be a pro one day. I, I'm, I was just like, dude, I, I haven't seen that type of authentic work ethic. Kobe like, you know, in the last 15 years, like, I just don't see it. But, you know, how, how do you do it? Well, one, you get yourself motivated, man. Like, have a goal, have a plan. You know, when you go out there, you got to have visualization. You got to have visualization to have a realization, right? And then you back it up with perspiration. So, have a goal. All right. You, you need to work on shooting off the dribble because every time you get it off slower. So, and you see yourself getting it blocked. Well, now you see yourself getting it off and you, you see imaginary defender in front of you. So, you know, be creative. And now kids can go on YouTube, but how many different drills can you do by yourself to get that shot off quicker? The footwork, the counters to the footwork. And as you're doing a counter, you know, imagine that invisible man or woman in front of you and add a time and a score to it. You don't have to have cones and boxes and all that. It's just you against the invisible man. And, you know, watching being around Kobe, he would do that a lot by himself. Now a lot of these guys have a rebounder, right? Right, a robot telling them what to do. And they're a robot and a zombie because they just do it without any visualization or creativity. And that's why I love your stuff, Chris, because you'll throw a, a wrinkle or a counter into a drill or a game like or surprise a kid. You know, one of the best things I heard the other day was uh, a certain Division II coach would have a timeout right in the middle of practice. He would send both teams spontaneously to each each coach on the bench, and they would draw up something they've never seen before, like that spontaneity. That's what you got to have in individual workouts, man. You got to you got to you got to create it on your own. You got to you know think about where the defense is, and so as you're working out, you're not just getting repetitional drills, although that's important. Elbow up, follow through. You're thinking about that. But you're also thinking about, all right, where are my other four teammates? Where are the other, you know, four defenders? But it's it's like taking a skill and just repping it, repping it, right? you know, spin it. You don't have a partner out there. All right, well, throw the ball against a wall. You know what I mean? Throw the ball against a backboard. Get a passing rep. Get it off the backboard. Now do a move. Put three balls on the floor, right? One ball in the corner, one ball on the elbow, one ball top of the key. Sprint to that ball. Shoot. Sprint to the other ball. Shoot. Like it's just, it's just getting these guys and girls off the internet, putting their phone in the trash, so to speak, and sitting down in solitude and just really creating their own workout from scratch, from their spirit, from their, you know, soul, from their basketball intuition. And that, that's what I did my whole life because we didn't have skill trainers and my, my cable only had five channels. So I'd watch Magic Johnson and Larry Bird on CBS on Sunday at 3.30 and then at 6.30, I was out in my backyard trying to do the hook, trying to do the Larry Bird shot fade, trying to do the John Stockton pocket pass in between trash cans, trying to do the John Stockton behind the back against the garage. I mean, it's just creating, man. Well, and in defensive kids, and, and I know we talk about this, we, you and I, but the problem for kids is that adults control too much. Like it's Correct. not their fault that they don't work on their own. It's our fault because we've created the environment where they only train with trainers. They only get coached by coaches and they only play in structure. And that's a big part of what I'm trying to sell people on is how to give the power back to kids, how to get freedom back to players, because they won't develop on their own if we don't put them in an environment where they can. Amen. Great point. I'll give you a great example. I play for a guy named Jerry Wainwright. He's at Tulsa now. Was it? Wake Forest recruited Tim Duncan, legend. I remember like it was yesterday, around mid-November, right? We've been practicing for about a month. He comes into the uh, practice. We do our huddle. He's like, all right, Gannon, you got him. You know what we do. First five drills. Let's go. Pass and follow. Interchange. And, man, I was like completely I, – like I froze. And he said, Gannon, you got 30 seconds to put your, your team – because I was the captain in the – 
And, man, I couldn't do it. And he called me the dumbest white boy he's ever coached. And everybody started laughing. I know he didn't mean that, right? Because, you know, uh, an hour later he said, hey, Chris Mann, you're the dumbest white player I've ever coached now. Like, But the whole, the whole practice, man, he asked each player at certain times, all right, run our five game. And so we had to organize it. Then he would call a timeout. Hey, Gannon, you got your team set up our 2-2-1 back into uh, whatever defense you want. You got a minute, go. Like, so I never forgot that. And then that, that's what I do in my workouts. I'll have a kid after I've been with him for a while. I was like, all right, you're taking a workout today. What's the first thing we do? And he'll say pray. So we pray. Second thing, right, we do stationary, we move him. Right. And so it gives power. It gives, you're teaching them what to, uh, how to think. You're, you're allowing them freedom. You don't have handcuffs. You know, like you said, it, it's not a communistic style of coaching, right? It's, it's shared coaching. It's democratic. They're not soldiers. They're not slaves. They're, they're real people making real decisions. And now you teach them how to be entrepreneurs in basketball, not employees. Because I guarantee you, if you ask somebody, would you rather own the building or work in it? They would rather own it. But they don't have the skill set to own it because they're afraid of the pain and they don't have the, the wisdom to do it. And that's why people fail at being leaders. They're afraid of the pain or don't know how to handle, handle the pain of being a leader and they don't have the wisdom. So, and then being with Manu Ginobili last summer, I, I was grilling him about the Spurs culture and pop. He and I were able to, to, to do some training in, in China for about four days and it was phenomenal because he was with us all day. And he said, man, pop was great at allowing us to run practice. And, and the culture of the Spurs was more player driven, although pop was in the watchtower, like he trusted us. We bought into him. He trusted us, and he, he, we had more fun because he didn't handcuff us. Now, when we messed up, yeah, he, he said some choice words. He, he, was, he was tough love, but you even saw it during games, man. He, he'd let uh, Tony Parker do a, you know, get, get the play board. He'd let Tim Duncan draw something up. You, we saw that, and then that wasn't anything new. Pop did that all the time, according to, to Manu. So it's that, like what you say, is powerful, man. Like we can just let these players not be puppets but be people. This movie, you'll have more retainment. You'll have players have more fun and even playing longer. Shannon, I can't thank you enough. I mean, just tremendous influence on the game over the years. And for young coaches that maybe haven't studied you or, or know about your stuff as, as much, and for all coaches that obviously know you already, I mean, I cannot encourage you enough. Number one, follow little Shannon on social media. He's on all platforms and does a great job sharing the game. And then uh, his website, Shannon, Again, BakerBasketball.com. Just, again, a great resource. Some great blogs on there, great information. And then, uh, you know, again, and I know uh, the mentorship program that you run. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thank you, Chris. You said some nice things about me. I always enjoy meeting new people and learning new things. But I do a lot of mentoring with, with coaches, just wanting to be better teachers on any level. And players, obviously, have been working out players for years. So I do a lot of player and coach mentoring. It's private mentoring. It's me coming to your school or, or program, we're working out your team, working out your coaches. I'm going to Indiana State Women's, I think, in June. If you're interested in that, we have a free mentorship program where we have Zoom calls and uh, emails and, and share content that way. Please contact me. I'd love to answer any questions or help you with basketball and life. My wife's a successful college basketball coach, so it's what we do. It's our life. It's changed our life. It's changed our family's life, and I know – I can help change yours. And so if there's interest there with me helping you out, just uh, get in touch with me. Well, and coaches, you can find all that information, cannonbakerbasketball.com. If you just go to the bottom, number one, you can join the mailing list. And number two, he's got all of his social media contacts and his email there too. So I know firsthand, if you reach out to Gannon, he gets back to you and uh, he loves basketball and loves sharing the game. So again, coach, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, Chris, iron sharpens iron, brother. So thank you. Yeah, awesome. Coach, now's the time. If you are not yet a member of basketballimmersion.com and our membership community, join today. I want to read one testimonial to you from a coach who had tremendous success over his time as a Basketball Immersion member. He recently sent me this email. Shout out to Chris Oliver and the Basketball Immersion community. Our small high school had gotten to one provincial final from the school's opening in 1978. I took over the girls program in 2011. Since joining Basketball Immersion in 2016, we have been to three finals in five years, and tonight we won the first high school basketball title in school history. 
so many people are a part of making it happen, but zero seconds training and basketball immersion and many of the basketball immersion principles have become a big part of our program. Thanks for all you do and all your ongoing support. Coach, it's time. If you're not yet a member, join basketballimmersion.com today and get your coaching stimulated. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.